Uh, good morning to all of you. Only a fool would uh, suggest such a title. Although I don't regard myself as a fool, I still propose this title because I thought it might set a tone for the workshop as a whole. Before I begin, I would like to um, say on behalf of all the organizers, in which I include myself, thanks to the ICTP, ICTS uh, staff, about which uh, Rajesh uh, spoke just a second ago, as being very responsive, which they are, and of course, uh, Rajesh himself, um, for allowing us to have this program. And uh, Rajesh in particular took uh, certain personal interest in it, as he explained, and I, I will explain later on. Um, I'm also happy to see the former director, Spenta Vardia, here. Although he's very busy doing his own things, uh, I'm still happy to have him uh, here. Um, now, I should say a little bit as the first speaker, the motivation uh, for this workshop. Um, I have seen this uh, sentence used a few times. I don't know who used it first, but I certainly used it. So it's a very ubiquitous phenomenon. And uh, it's, uh, um, I can go on and on as to why it is important. But to give you some examples of the big problems in which it plays a role, um, this geodynamo, which is very important for our planet, would not exist if it were not for turbulence interacting with the magnetic field. Similarly, from the cosmic dust, how planets are formed, it's just particle dynamics with turbulence. Or if you go into practice, there is the flow on gas turbine engines, which is one of the most complex fluid flows one can imagine. Um, the scope of this workshop, however, is not any of these. It's hydrodynamic turbulence in 3D. So I do not even include 2D, for instance. And what modern field theory might teach us, though everything else is welcome, I mean, there is no reason to limit oneself in any way. The scope is not an undue limitation in my view, although it sort of makes it pure. Um, sometimes uh, puritanical thinking is not very conducive for growth of ideas. It's, it's because mathematicians, physicists, and practicing engineers have serious stake in this subject. It's not just they're intellectually curious about it, but really have a great deal of stake. So I think it is at one, uh, one, one and the same time focused, but also quite broad. So for my own talk about which I already made my apologies, um, what's the sine qua non of turbulence? Um, in fact, there is no better word, a better phrase than sine qua non to describe uh, the essentials without which there isn't. Um, and of course, here in ICTS, people are very educated besides science. So I looked for a Sanskrit word. Uh, this is what I think it is, actually, Avashakam. Um, then, for this question, there is no sharp answer, unfortunately. Different uh, disciplines view the subject differently. But I, I will try to put them together in some fashion. It reminds me of this story from the Buddhist parable, the elephant and six blind men. This is often used in lectures on turbulence. But different people who are blind thought of the elephant as, as different things. I will attempt a minimalistic list that needs to be addressed before claiming success, let's say more as an introduction to the workshop. Um, it's not that I claim uh, expertise in all of them. And clearly what I say will be influenced by my own limitations. Uh, I try not to be too parochial. And uh, there have been many great ideas in the past, um, which I shall not consider. I'm only 
thinking about more recent ones. Whatever one might say and whatever uh, my list and however much you might disagree with it, but if somebody solves a very major problem, everybody will take notice. So it's not like you'll have to go through my list. There are some major problems of which I give you one example. Uh, the example is of that of thermal convection uh, in, uh, in a box. So this work is already um, so many years old and revised later on. In one apparatus, we were able to go in Rayleigh number about 11 orders of magnitude. That's not the impressive part. The impressive part really is that if you're sitting at the Rayleigh numbers like 10 power 16 or so, you just read off from here that this quantity, which is the actual transport, divided by what would be possible only by molecular means or conduction uh, is plotted. So uh, for this really number, it would be about 10,000 or so. So essentially what it means is that if you are at this high really number, which is not that unusually large in geophysical and astrophysical context, the turbulent transport is many, many fold larger than what would be possible without turbulence? I think that's the reason we should take turbulence seriously. So if, for instance, somebody came up with a real theory for why the data plot on this nice line, um, people will take notice. Forget about my list. So keep that in mind um, at the back of it. And uh, one thing I should first uh, start by saying is that is the turbulence problem the same as the Navier-Stokes problem? That is, let's say that's a realization of homogeneous and isotropic turbulence. And this is the, these are the Navier-Stokes equation. You have another equation, continuity equation, which I didn't write down. U is the velocity, which is all you need to remember, besides the fact that nu is the viscosity, and P is the pressure. So the, the whole thing is, as nu becomes very small, what are the properties of this equation? That is the Navier-Stokes problem. Of course, I don't know whether that is the actual turbulence problem, so to speak, you can see it. Um, this question has been asked many times in the past, at least starting 1959, and the people have always answered, yes, the two are the same. Um, the arguments are based on the fact that you have a smallest scale in turbulence and that has a certain time scale and a length scale and you compare it with something like the molecular scales and you find it is many, many fold larger. And uh, so you say, yeah, this is fine. Uh, but actually you can uh, revise this. The smallest scale is actually smaller than what people thought, et cetera. So if I computed the ratio of the smallest scale divided with the mean free path, it goes like a Reynolds number to the power some m, where m I do not know anything about. So um, in principle, it is possible that uh, m is positive and larger um, than zero, that is what I mean. So then of course this ratio could in fact get we have for a unity for small scales. And then you have a problem. You are doing Navier-Stokes on a computer, exploring very, very small scales. On the other hand, you create turbulence, which um, may have other influences as well. A related question is the size of the attractor. And if it is so large that the smallest length scales lie on the molecular levels, then the Navier-Stokes as a model for turbulence is a problem. And David Ruel actually wrote this small paper on how thermal fluctuations can in principle determine the uh, measure of a turbulent flow. But uh, there's a huge overlap between the two, between this and that. And in any case, I know no better. So I will move on. I will move on and think that they are the same but keep that at the back of your mind. Because uh, you can start with this wonderful um, Clay Math uh, Institute problem on the 
and maybe a slot equation, which it says here is unsolved. And what's the problem? It's a regularity problem. And the regularity problem says, in three dimensions and time, if you start with initial velocity field, there exists or not, a vector velocity and a scalar passive field, which are both smooth and globally defined. So that's the problem. It has, as I said, not been uh, proven. And I will uh, dwell a little bit on why this might be interesting. Of course, for this proof to make any difference in practice, you will have to at least show that the finite bound exists within a finite time. If you have some bound happening in hyper exponential time, it may not matter to you in any way. And of course, you should have long-term averages that you can compute. Now, um, whether or not there's regularity uh, for the Navier-Stokes, I want to point out that there may be difficulties on the way. The difficulties are, this is a very pragmatic view of, uh, of the thing. Uh, difficulties with the DNS. DNS means direct numerical simulations. So what you do is take the Navier-Stokes equation in a, let's say a, a cubic box and uh, discretize it with the smallest scale in the flow and advance it with the smallest time scale in the problem. And you get the solutions of the Navier-Stokes equation. So you think you get the solutions. And then uh, you can compute whatever you want um, from those uh, results, simulation results. But I want to point out one big problem. In 1972, when the first set of computations were made by Steve Arzog and, uh, and uh, Patterson, they used a cube which is 32 cube, that is the box in which the fluid resided, which became turbulent at 32 on the side, so 32 cube. And now the latest one, uh, PK Young leads the effort, uh, you will see even my name here, but never mind. There's 32,768 cube. So it's a billion fold larger um, uh, in, uh, in the box size. It's uh, corresponding to a trillion fold increasing computing power, roughly speaking. And I know of no other um, scientific tool that has uh, enhanced itself in the time between, let's say, 72 and now, which is 50 years except perhaps maybe synchrotron light sources. But if you look at what kind of advances have been made in material science, uh, complex fluids and things like that, um, I would uh, have to admit there is a problem. The problem is that simply going by the sheer size uh, that has increased from uh, 1972 to now, you would expect a million fold increase in Reynolds number or a thousand fold in so-called microscale Reynolds number, which is just basically a square root of that. But if you actually sit down and do the calculations, you can barely achieve 1 50th of this expectation, 1 50th of a uh, thousand. And why is that? Uh, is it simply that there are many technical uh, things to concern ourselves with? Or is there something deeper, um, deeper, in the sense that maybe we're not doing it right, or maybe the Navier-Stokes equations do not possess strong, singular, strong solutions. Um, if it doesn't have strong solutions, which would come from the regularity problem we talked about, then we only have little half weak solutions. And we know weak solutions exist, but they are not unique. We also know that. So what does it mean to actually do the uh, turbulence simulations at such large scale? Uh, will, it, uh, will, it be, uh, will it answer the fundamental questions you're after? I, I don't know the answer to this, but I am only pointing out to you that we have a problem. We may need new and better ways, yeah. Yeah, uh, weak solutions are solutions only in a distributional sense. That is, you integrate something and you, you have the solution. 
A strong solution is point by point. And that's what we do not know. We do not know whether the smooth solutions for Navier Stokes exist, uh, exist and what kind of uh, properties they have. Of course, we think we compute them all the time, the solutions, but are we computing them in, in, the, in the real sense? I will, uh, we will discuss this a little bit more later on. Now, proving regularity by current methods may not be possible if what I say is, uh, is worth, uh, worth its salt. Now, on the optimistic side, if we actually discover something new by in, in such considerations, it will be very helpful for other computing tools in turbulence and uh, obtaining statistically steady states. So that is uh, one caveat. The other problem I would like to say a little bit about is, yeah. Uh, I would imagine that uh, singularities might be really rare in the solutions because when the Navier-Stokes equation was written down, we didn't know about the microscopic nature of matter. So you do expect this to break down at some scale. Therefore, this, th this was my first slide where I said, is turbulence the same as Navier-Stokes, right? It's you're uh, entirely right in speculating that there might be a good overlap, but not really entirely equivalent. It's uh, entirely possible. But for the previous slide, I just took Navier Stokes as the God given thing, and I want to proceed with it, and I want to consider what limitations it has. Um, now, we are interested in, in not in Navier Stokes per se, but in the vanishing viscosity limit of the Navier Stokes. That is, viscosity goes to zero. That means the Reynolds number, which is essentially the inverse of it goes to infinity. I mean, this is what big problems in, uh, in fluid mechanics are involved in. Um, so that's what we are after. And uh, so this is a kind of 21st century problem. Uh, although, of course, um, you know that uh, experience from experience that if the symmetry breaking parameter new vanishes, is symmetry breaking because if nu is put to zero identically, you have either equations. Um, and, but uh, what you find is that as the viscosity goes to zero, the symmetry is not restored. In other words, the appropriate equations are not Euler equations, but they're really still Navier-Stokes. And uh, this, of course, you know, it's the 18th century fluid mechanics, uh, D'Alembert's paradox just uh, ruled the um, as second half of the 18th century. Euler, when he proposed the equations, thought he had really solved everything, but we know that he really didn't do um, what he thought he was doing. I have one question. Yeah. And when you talk about Navier-Stokes, you think really the deterministic evolution, or you think about random initial data? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I will come closer to you and then you can repeat your question. No, no, this is my, when you talk about Navier-Stokes, I mean, you think about the deterministic evolution or do you also put random initial data which might sort of change the game? It, it might change you in nominally when you actually do the computations, you put in random initial conditions at very large scales and you let the flow evolve. That's yeah. what you do. Now, uh, this Dalembert's paradox basically said that if viscosity is put to zero, then the force on any object is zero, but experience shows that the drag on a sphere as the viscosity goes to zero, which is this way, the Reynolds number goes to infinity, it undergoes some complicated maneuver, but eventually it becomes a finite number of order unity. This is the data from 1968. So a particular manifestation of this, which is called the 21st century problem, is a so-called dissipative anomaly. Dissipative anomaly means that even when the viscosity goes to zero, there's a finite amount of energy that is dissipated in, in a turbulent flow. It doesn't go to zero. In other words, if the energy dissipation, this is identity, this is an identity, is viscosity times the square of the gradient in the flow, 
then this has to diverge as viscosity goes to zero if this remains finite. Now, uh, that means somehow or the other, at small scales, things become um, more and more uh, diverging just so as to compensate for the vanishing viscosity, so the, uh, the, uh, the finiteness of the energy dissipation is valid. So that actually means something uh, for the structure of the flow at very small distances, and this is the same as ultraviolet divergence, although somehow turbulence reduces its own, its own um, uh, divergence instead of coming from other external source. Now, dissipative anomaly is the common basis for many features of 3D turbulence, the so-called four-fifths law of Kolmogorov. If you want to prove it, you better have dissipative anomaly valid. And Kolmogorov spectral relation, anomalous exponents, about all of which I will say a little bit. And uh, I called it the zeroth law of turbulence many years ago, and my friends attributed to me uh, even now. So what is the basis for all this? The basis for all this is a picture like this. So what is plotted here is the dissipation in some normalized units as a function of Reynolds number. Uh, this is a micro scale Reynolds number, therefore the numbers are a few hundreds, the actual Reynolds number is square of it. Um, and these are obtained from uh, grid turbulence. And what you see is for small, Reynolds numbers are large viscosities. There's a variation with respect to viscosity, but thereafter, once the viscosity reaches a certain small value, small enough value, it becomes independent of that. And how did I get uh, these data? Um, this, by the way, is a theory which can make up for low Reynolds numbers. These are from flows like this. You have a grid of bars and the flow going from left to right. And as you can see near the grid, there's a certain structure, but eventually if you go far enough away from the grid, so for example here, uh, you will see that this is forms its own, it's like its own animal, which is the homogeneous and isotropic turbulence we study. And here you can compute this quantity and compute the Reynolds number and plot all this uh, data. And this is the problem about which Sasha Migdal has been working on lately and I'm sure he will speak a little bit about it later on. Um, this picture is from Nagiman Park. Now, after this diagram was created, I even did uh, from simulations, which is sort of showing the same pattern, and many others that followed confirmed this uh, simulations. Canada, uh, Diego, I was involved in it as well in all these other others. So, um, now, there appears to be some recent revision of this outlook, which I will tell a little bit about, uh, which we, Kartik, who is here, and I have been working on for the last five years, to the um, unhappiness of all my colleagues, I keep uh, revising it and postponing it. Now, if you can prove this result, that this result of, uh, of uh, dissipative anomaly, or the zeroth law, then it goes some way in establishing a theory of uh, turbulence. Because as I said, it really underlies a whole lot of other things. Uh, how do you prove it? You can prove it if you can from Navier-Stokes equations directly. I already said we have no idea about this. We ask whether the weak solutions of Navier-Stokes obey dissipative anomaly. And there have been some work on this, which appears to say no. Now, what has gone on in the, in the, in the, in the field is something really very interesting that arose from uh, the so-called Ansager conjecture. I put it in quotation marks because half of it has been proved and the other half has not been proved. Now, what is it that uh, Ansager conjectured? He said, well, the inviscid limit of Navier-Stokes, this is the one that gives you finite dissipation, et cetera. Now it corresponds not to so much to the properties of Navier-Stokes per se, um, although it should, 
but to singular weak solutions of Euler equations, as opposed to smooth, strong solutions. You know that Euler equation has strong solutions which are smooth, and they give you zero drag and zero dissipation and things like that. So in fact, if you have any dissipation coming from Euler, it has to be from the weak solutions. And yeah. But Berkers found many, many years ago the vortex, which explicitly is a singular solution, and it yes. has this dissipation. It does, but this uh, it has a certain formal structure to it, and and um, it uh, connects to Kolmogorov somehow, and it, so it sort of makes a, a more uh, wholesome story. Now, this part has not been proved. That is to say, we don't know whether the weak solutions to either equations really correspond to the dissipative solutions of navier Stokes. We have really no idea about that. This is a part that's not been proved. But the part that has been proved is that the dissipative weak uh, Euler solutions have holder exponents which are less than or equal to one third. Holder exponent meaning if you take the velocity and take its difference over a, over a spatial interval r, take its absolute value, it goes like r to the power some h, and this h is the holder exponent. And for uh, dissipative uh, weak solutions of Euler, that's less than or equal to one third. This is the one which really took an enormous amount of time by a number of very clever people uh, working their way through. First, they got it less than one eighth, one tenth, like that, and slowly went up to less than or equal to one third. That part is proved. And this paper is the, I think, the ultimate um, uh, result of the whole thing. Yeah. Law no, I mean, he proved it in some sense, but if you want to look at it from a mathematical point of view, that's not a proof because you haven't proved the dissipative anomaly that there's a finite dissipation, etc. And mathematicians wouldn't regard that as proof at all. Whereas uh, hacks like me would regard it as enough proof, but it is, it's strictly not a proof at all. Um, now, uh, of course, you can go from now on, you can go via this route or via this route to prove the uh, dissipative anomaly. I don't know which is easier. I have no way of knowing about this, but both are sort of going on in the community at large. Now, the, the wrinkle on this, which is the part that I referred to earlier, is that uh, the dissipative anomaly to occur Remember, the gradient field has to diverge. Uh, this is um, sort of analogous to ultraviolet divergence, they called it. Let's call it strong anomaly. Um, but what if instead of epsilon, epsilon being constant with increasing Reynolds number, it really does decay very slowly? Uh, will, it, will it change everything? Now this, let's call it a weak anomaly after uh, these guys and uh, these velocity divergence, the gradient field still diverges. And there is a little theorem due to Drivers and Iink, which showed that if this result is true, that you take the third moment with the absolute values and compare it with third moment without absolute values, this is the four fifths law that uh, Spenta just mentioned about the property of this. Compare this with that. If you see a slight difference um, in a certain way, then weak anomaly is supposed to hold. The point is that um, uh, this has to do with the symmetry of uh, the velocity gradient and things like that, and we can discuss it at some length. Now let's go to the uh, next uh, uh, point of my uh, talk, which is, uh, so far, everything I've said uh, thinks of turbulence as a PDE problem. You somehow have the navier stocks and you churn your machinery through and you get uh, some regular solutions or, or not, and uh, you have uh, turbulence. But actually, uh, you may take the opposite view. The turbulence is not a PDE problem at all, but one of statistical physics. It doesn't mean they are exclusive of each other. Uh, it's about uh, not the individual solutions in the Stokes, but a 
statist statistical behavior of ensemble of solutions. So solving a problem of turbulence would require us to discover the properties of this probability measure um, in the 3D domain. So that's a different point of view to take. In other words, you may solve the regularity problem left, right, and center, but may really not make a huge difference to uh, I actually wrote down two caveats here about the turbulence is, everybody says is a far from equilibrium system. And it's mostly because you have energy flux going from the large to the small scale. And whenever you have flux, you don't know how to deal with statistical mechanical problems that I know of anyhow. But really the flux is only a small difference between two roughly equal quantities. This may make a huge difference to how one thinks about it. So there is a, on the whole flux going like this, but is it simply going all the way like this or is it simply going back and forth and back and forth, but there's a small difference between the back and forth, which gives you the flux on the average. Um, that is an important problem, an important aspect about which uh, one hasn't thought through very much. And my own view is that as in all statistical physics problems, um, you really need a significant combination of mathematics, physics and numerical insight uh, in order to make a theory. And uh, each time insisting everything comes from the source, so to speak, may not be as reasonable as in some fields. Yeah. Equivalent, I mean, you're looking for a probability measure yes. on the space of initial conditions. Yes. Uh, is that problem mathematically equivalent to adding a noise term to the Navier-Stokes equation so that it becomes a stochastic equation? But at least uh, in, uh, in the case of passive scalars, I think that is true. But maybe Grisha can say more about this. Yeah. But uh, this noise business has been swept under the rug for Navier strokes for very long. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, the next uh, comment I wanted to make was, um, if I can move this. Um, okay. Uh, how would I think about it? I would think about it if you want to get the go about it like this. Uh, you have robust statistical properties in high Reynolds number regime, and you would have to somehow find new statistical laws, which we are new principles, uh, which satisfy the loss of turbulence. I should have put loss of turbulence within quotation marks, but we have to specify them or discover them. I mean, there is no other way, this is the way. Uh, life works in statistical physics. So one of them is the Kolmogorov's 1941 theory, which tells you that the energy spectral density, when you decompose against the wave number, uh, has a minus five thirds, minus is there, but you can't see it that well. Uh, this is a celebrated result. Everyone who knows anything about turbulence knows this. Everyone, uh, whether they do work in turbulence or not, oh, five, five, five thirds law. Um, I, 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 will, I will say this in the same slide a little bit later. Now, actually, um, if you can compute this spectrum from one single velocity field, not at a statistical ensemble, uh, you remember the Ansager's interpretation and all this kind of stuff. So in fact, this, if you observe this, this says something about the, the, the regularity of uh, the, uh, the uh, equations, but I will not carry this forward. So uh, for the Navier-Stokes equation subject to some generic external forcing, uh, one hopes to be able to construct a theory for the power spectrum. So that'll be one of the problems I would pose for myself. The results may not be in a precise scaling form like this, but it may be hidden in some complicated formula from which you can somehow extract the scaling to arbitrary accuracy. Um, 
Now, how, how good is this? In uh, one of the experimental measurements that Brewer and I made in the atmospheric turbulence at, uh, oh, sorry, um, at um, one of the highest Reynolds numbers ever attained, you plot the energy spectrum as a function of wave number, you see a scaling regime, which is several orders of magnitude here in the scale, which I think is uh, pretty clear. But if you compute this exponent corresponding to it, it is slightly different from five thirds. In fact, if you normalize by five thirds, you get a line instead of being flat uh, with a slight slope. So in fact, uh, therefore, uh, people would say, well, is the five thirds real, etc.? Are the departures from five thirds that you see here, are they universal? And how would one obtain this prefactor? That was the question spent of asking. And on what does the prefactor depend? We have no idea about this. We know empirically lots of things, but we don't know how to compute it. Um, and uh, I can take, this uh, slide, which Karthik uh, prepared for me, Reynolds number on this axis. Remember, this is always square root of the actual Reynolds number. And that X spectral exponent, this is um, minus five thirds, um, uh, whatever, one is taken out of something. Yeah. Now the actual data are here. Um, it looks like there is um, quite a bit of scatter, but nevertheless, no trend. So uh, perhaps um, one can say that it is a real difference. And occasionally it is argued that difference is very small. You see here this difference and consider the scatter. But there are other important quantities that possess zero order difference from Kolmogorov's form. and calculate its acceleration, which is a very important quantity in fluid dynamics. So you just see the Lagrangian derivative of the, of the velocity. And you take the mean square value of this. If Kolmogorov were right, then this number, which is the mean square divided by the Kolmogorov estimate, would be a number of order unity independent of Reynolds number. It would be somewhere, wherever it is, a flat quantity. Whereas actually in reality, all measurements, um, which I took from this paper, um, uh, have a very strong dependence. And in fact, there is no indication at all that they would slow down anytime soon. And you can uh, fit a function like this and you can actually make a little bit of theory. And when I say a little bit of theory, it is, um, it is a, a semi-empirical kind of theory which uh, explains uh, these data. So the point is, Kolmogorov's thing might seem to work for you at the level of energy spectrum, roughly at any rate. And therefore I'm hoping that if you make up a theory, you will get something like that. But uh, the truth is that, um, you know, there are many other quantities for which the effect is first order instead of being flat. It, there is no argument about whether this is are deviating from uh, Kolmogorov or not. So these deviations are supposed to arise from the so-called intermittency, which is that if you measure a quantity like the energy dissipation and take a line cut in a turbulent flow and measure it, you will see something like this. That is, it is not uniform or mildly varying as in a Gaussian process or something like that, but it is varying very widely sometimes as, as here, tens of thousands of times larger than the mean value, uh, something like that. So in fact, this is the intermittence. So uh, small scale somehow, even though your forcing is now uniform spatially, et cetera, as you go down to smaller and smaller scales, it becomes uh, uh, like this. It's not just the amplitudes that are varying, but actually if you, take a two dimensional cut in the flow. This is from simulations uh, from Canada et al 2007. You take a slice in the flow. You can see the small scales like this sort of clustered ar around uh, some places with voids in between. 
you take a box like this and expand it, which is what is done here. Again, you see the same feature exacerbated um, in some fashion. And then uh, you take this box and you do this. So it is not always that the amplitudes are um, widely varying, but there's a clustering of events, a clustering of certain features, which are also a very important part of the of intermittency, which is something we did uh, look at uh, some years ago. Now, uh, there has been considerable um, work on how to describe these such variations. And one of them is the so-called multifractors. And basically what it says is, you define, you take two parameters, alpha and f of all f, which depends on alpha, let's say, uh, which is such that alpha denotes the uh, strength of these singularities. That is, if alpha is very small, then it blows up uh, near there. And uh, f simply denotes how densely they're distributed. So essentially you can have fractal sets that correspond to fixed values of alpha or alpha between alpha and alpha plus d delta alpha. And f simply describes the, um, the dimension of that set. So given this alpha and f of alpha, a curve, which may be like that, for instance, or you can have a Legendre transform pair, which is related to um, uh, the, uh, the Q and D of Q. And this is basically the same thing. Q uh, will tell you how large moments, for instance, are described, or small moments are described by varying this Q. And D simply is, again, the uh, dimension of the set corresponding to this Q. And now, if you have this curve somehow given to you by God himself or herself um, or itself these days, um, then you can compute many of the things. But how you derive this f of alpha or q dq curve is not known. And uh, simply because there might be a number of people here who might hold different views, I want to say that it has many pedigrees. For dissipative scales, Benoit Mandelbrot was the first one to, who uh, told me how to do this. And we did uh, many of the things later on. For inertial scales, it was Parisi, Giorgio Parisi and Frisch, and uh, many other Italian colleagues of uh, Giorgio. And for dynamical systems, mostly Leo Kadnoff and his colleagues at the University of Chicago. So different people can claim different amounts of credit for it, but that's not important at all. Now, um, going from here on, um, I want to show you a little bit of um, the consequences, we think, which are large anomalies. That is not tiny bit of difference uh, from the Kolmograph form, which is the definition of anomaly for us. There's a deviation from uh, Kolmograph, more or less. Uh, so let's take about, think about the so-called longitudinal velocity differences and the exponent corresponding to them. What is uh, that supposed to mean? I take the velocity in space at a position x plus r and take, uh, remove from it velocity at x. So I have two um, spatial positions r apart and I'm looking at the velocity difference between them. Why is that important? For example, if you want to understand the uh, motion of a fluid particle, uh, the velocity difference can be decomposed into strain and uh, rotation. And these are the things that will characterize the evolution of the fluid particle. And if you say that this goes like r to the power some zeta n, uh, n uh, is this moment to which you can raise this, and zeta of n depends on n or may not depend on n, depends. Let's say, suppose we do that, and we compute this zeta n from uh, say simulations like that. And in this paper, this is what you find. This is the moment order, that is this n here. Higher the moment order, it will uh, give rise to um, moments that are contributed to by bigger and bigger peaks, for instance, right? The higher moments come from the tails of the probability density, and they correspond to huge peaks. Um, and now, these are the exponents. 
this would be a Kolmograph. Um, and a second order, which is what the spectral thing uh, uh, is about, is here. You can see this is Kolmograph and there is, this, uh, there is the average value from all those data points. And it only is slightly different. But if you go to high order moments, the difference is uh, completely um, uh, clear. Now, these are the measurements. And two of them are uh, models. Um, and I say appear to be universal because many different flows seem to give the same number. Um, the lines, the upper two lines are some models, uh, one of which um, is mine. And a theory, which is, I should have put a slight quotation marks, slight quotation marks, because there are some doubts in my own mind, uh, which, which is this uh, dash uh, dotted uh, line. Now, so if you take the theory for granted, then maybe we have some understanding of these exponents. And the theory is due to uh, Victor Yakut, although uh, we published it like this, uh, my name first. Uh, Victor has been talking about it for quite some time. And the theory is basically you start with the Navier-Stokes. As I said, God given equation. Now I write down the half equation corresponding to that. Uh, so you write the equation for the, uh, for Z. And then uh, from it, you re reduce it to equations for structure functions, which is the moments of velocity differences. Then for small scales, you apply a point splitting, which is uh, relatively easy to do. And then you match the behavior at the large scale, uh, thinking that the large scale is a Gaussian, um, uh, a Gaussian field. And then you get uh, explicit expressions for the anomalous exponents, which is what I showed you. And one of the things that this theory shows is that if you go to large order moments, the, the exponents actually saturate. So that is, um, this is the Kolmograph line. These are the data that I showed you earlier, but the saturation becomes obvious much more if you look at the so-called transverse exponents, which is velocity differences perpendicular to the difference, the separation distance. And uh, you can see that they seem to saturate if the moments saturate for very large order moment, uh, the exponents saturate for very large order moments, then what it means is that in the flow, there are regions, just as in shocks, jumps in velocity across the smallest distances, which are of the order of the largest velocity in the flow. That is, even though your distances are very small, there are places where the jumps across those small distances can be as large as possible, you know. If I have a velocity field which has a maximum value somehow, set it, imagine a jet, jet has a certain velocity coming in and then the outside velocity is zero. So the maximum velocity difference I can have is zero and the jet velocity. But even if you're in the middle of the jet, um, many, many distances away, it's possible that you will sometimes see uh, uh, velocity jumps of the order you. And this actually has some implications on the dynamics. Um, uh, so I, I wrote down here, um, um, if I can move it backwards. So there are very large differences like this that happen in the flow. And one more uh, thing I will say, and then I will uh, close this chapter. In particular, let us talk about the Lagrangian exponent, that is, you don't sit in the flow and calculate the velocity differences, but you follow a trajectory of the particle, fluid particle, and take the velocity difference over a certain time interval, and you calculate the exponents the same way. And what you find uh, from this paper, what you find again is the, um, the scaling exponent as a function of the r of the moment, instead of following k41, are deviating from it in some fashion, they actually saturate. And you can make up a little theory for how they saturate and how they're connected to other um, exponents, etc. 
Okay, so that is what I want to talk about anomaly, but I also want to talk a little bit about the case of circulation, which as Rajesh said, is somehow at the back of the, the meeting that we are organizing here. Such a Migdal, when he was still young, uh, calculated uh, things. And uh, then uh, nobody paid attention, although I wrote some papers at the time, uh, the Reynolds numbers were small that I could really not tell very much. And since then, that's a little history. Since then, uh, Karthik and I, we wrote this paper in PhysRevX and Sasha saw this and said, well, this is really exciting. People finally have paid attention to what I was saying. And he wanted to come back full time to doing physics. So one of my claims to fame is that uh, somehow I was partly responsible for getting Sasha back into physics. Yes, you resurrected me from my grave. <laughs> <laughs> so what, uh, what is Sasha saying? He's saying, don't take velocity differences. Take the circulation around a contour, contour of a certain size. Um, so the equivalent of the velocity, di uh, the separation distance that I had in the earlier slides could be, for instance, the square root of the area, for instance. So this is the area, so you do u dot uh, dl, uh, L, dl being the elemental length along the contour. And by Stokes theorem, it is the same as vorticity, that uh, average vorticity that comes out of this area perpendicular to this plane. So as I said, r is like a square root of a. Yeah. Now you can compute its statistical properties of the circulation and look at how they vary with respect to the area of the contour or to the uh, equivalently R. You can not only have uh, areas like this, but you can also have more complicated areas like this. And uh, not only that, but also in uh, three-dimensional space, etc. And we looked at all that. And in fact, they scale very well and sorry, the figure got cut out, but this is a few orders of magnitude in the scale here. So this is uh, what uh, Sasha was doing using uh, uh, quantum gravity loops and things like that. And I barely understood what he was doing 25 years ago. Now I understand a little bit better because he keeps talking to me and sending me his preprints. I have to read them. Um, now, the same thing out of the moment here and the exponent here, these are the data here, and this would be the Kolmogorov line. And there is deviation, but the deviation is not really anymore as large as uh, one claimed. In fact, I don't know whether this is a finite uh, something effect or whether it is, is uh, real like that. We actually said it is a bifractal, one space filling fractal up to there, and then uh, slightly um, non-space filling beyond here. And this point of departure varies with the Reynolds number. So in fact, if you go to higher and higher Reynolds number, this point moves further and further to the right. So in fact, you may think that it may eventually become just a, a chromograph line, but the probability densities are not Gaussian as one would have thought for a chromograph are nearly Gaussian but they are uh, very, uh, very uh, spread out uh, like in many other processes in turbulence. So uh, Karthik will talk about this a little bit more and Sasha will build some of it into his talk somehow. So I will not say more, but I want to now talk about, um, I have uh, approximately eight minutes and I'll try to finish by the time. Um, now I want to talk about flows that are not as simple as homogeneous uh, isotropic turbulence, but something more complicated like this. This is a flow going from left to right, and here I have a wall. And once I have a wall, I have a huge complexity. And what is the traditional perspective? The traditional perspective is many of the properties are already here that is energy spectra, enhanced mixing and dissipation, all of that. But the flow geometry, that the boundary conditions, will induce large coherent structures like here. 
and somehow you have now transfer of energy between fluctuations and transfer of energy between coherent structures in the background and all of that stuff. And these details are different for different flows. So the, therefore, the dynamics is really a combination of the universal on which I have tried to spend a lot of time on and uh, specific. Now, if you take uh, anything like this, you have no control on the, on the velocity fluctuations except what you put in uh, by hand. But here you have a really very important um, influence of the boundary. Even on, uh, on uh, periodic boxes, the effect of the boundary can be felt uh, very significantly. The main problem from an engineer's perspective, which is what I will take in the next slide or two, um, is that you have to deal with the universal and the non-universal in some judicious fashion. And one hopes that the problem for an engineering perspective will be solved if I have a good model that can compute these flows uh, with acceptable accuracy. You may not worry about uh, exponents and anomalies and things like that, but just put it in there and you get uh, the things out. And of course, the properties that you compute from all these things that I have discussed would be very useful in devising these models. And if once you have these models uh, working well for you, then you might say, okay, I have this toolbox. Whenever I want to compute something, I will compute it. And as far as I'm concerned, that is pretty much done. So a very good example is uh, this boundary layer. Now here, I just want to make two remarks, both of which would be a shocker to uh, people who've been working on this in fluid dynamics. Uh, so the velocity distribution as a function of the distance from the wall is supposed to go like a logarithm. And there's a constant sitting in front, which is goes by von Karman. And um, not because of his name, but because of hundreds of other, hundreds of experiments, it is thought to be universal. But actually now people think that that is not necessarily true. In fact, the mean velocity is not universal. I, I, after many, many years, 60 years, 80 years, people have begun to allow for the possibility that the mean velocity is not universal in the sense that this is not universal, depends on the pressure gradient, for instance. And as far as fluctuations go, there are theories one of which says that the fluctuations go like a logarithm of the Reynolds number. And the other one that says that yes, they might increase initially, but they're eventually saturating according to this. If the Reynolds number goes to infinity, uh, this number will uh, just go to zero. So phi, uh, phi just approaches some phi infinity. Uh, yeah, there's some uh, typo error here. But nevertheless, um, now that's the paper in which we wrote out the theory. And uh, here is, you take any quantity here. Uh, this is the conventional, uh, conventional logarithmic growth. And this is the theory that we just made up. And I would claim that the theory we made up is a little bit better. And eventually we'll have to go to much higher Reynolds number in order to approve or disprove this, but at least it is there. And similarly, you can make a same theory for the moments of the velocity. And again, this is the conventional theory, and this is the theory that one made. If uh, uh, the theory we made up is correct, what it implies without going through these arguments is that the so-called inner outer interaction is essentially a low, low Reynolds number effect. That is to say, I have things near the wall and things away from the wall. Much of the work in the, in the literature is, is focused on the interaction between what is at the wall and what is away from the wall. Um, basically, this says, yes, this interaction occurs at finite Reynolds number, but if you go to very high Reynolds numbers, it probably vanishes. Momentum does, yes, it does. So, it, uh, it, it is connected only through the friction velocity. It is, it is, see, the traditional idea was that all the energy or most of the energy is produced near the wall. 
and most of it also is dissipated at the wall. So the difference between the two is sort of pushed out or diffused outwards, and that's what maintains the outer layer uh, from what is coming from near the wall. Now, what uh, this would say is that, uh, in fact, uh, eventually the, that difference will vanish. It'll, whatever is produced locally at the wall is dissipated locally at the wall. So the outer one maintains itself because it has its own gradients and its own production, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a history um, and uh, this local production that maintains it. So somehow the only connection between them is the friction velocity, that is the shear stress of the wall. Um, so I, I will uh, try to finish this up. Um, so what will now, summarizing all this, what will bring the field to some level of closure? Um, um, it's a strong coupling problem uh, because the Reynolds number is the coupling parameter. And uh, there may be many open questions. I only talked about a few and we don't know how to answer them. Uh, a quantitative solution to these and other problems requires significant combination of math, physics, and numerical insights. Um, and uh, physical includes experimental. So one uh, class of problems is centered around dissipative anomaly. Regularity of the Navier-Stokes, weak solutions of Euler, connections between them, K41, all this is all one class of problems. It might look like many and uh, different people work on a little bit of it. And so for them, it might look a very many problems, but it really is one class. And the other class, again, um, uh, is related to intermittency. Theory of anomalous scaling exponent. I showed you already several exponents. It cannot be that there will be multiplicity of them if they are in fact real. Um, the saturation of exponents. And on this, considerable progress has been made on passive scalars. Visha was one of the people who led the effort um, uh, some years ago. Uh, and he was still younger at the time. Um, now, I didn't talk about it. Uh, I only focused on hydrodynamic part. And I did also not talk about the 2D turbulence, which is quite important and interesting. And the third class is the effect of boundary conditions and fluctuations. In particular, I talked about log law. Uh, is it no, is not sacrosanct anymore. And of course, the one on which I spoke least about is from a practical perspective, uh, you know, there are infinite flow, infinite number of flows. Um, you don't have a priori solutions for all of them. Basically, you have a toolkit which enables you to solve each problem as you get them. And uh, this is the engineering, computing, engineering flows, the K epsilon methods, um, which Victor Yakut uh, worked on, uh, LES, the large JD simulations, which is basically coarse graining uh, the scales more and more, and use all the scaling properties of small scales in order to uh, write an equation for the large scale which you solve on a computer. And then the real problem is one doesn't know how to uh, include the proper boundary conditions into these models, and that's where the uh, effort is. So that's one, uh, the last slide, which is sort of socio, uh, sociological, is that the turbulence problem, as we talked about, uh, I tried to give a kind of unified view. Uh, it's also about sociology of the field. I think it is true if you have a big field, uh, like turbulence or plasma physics or something like that, um, occasionally the problem becomes the research agenda of a powerful group, and then they go on with it to whether it makes sense or not um, for some years at any rate. Um, understanding it, um, this sociology may be important for us in general. Everyone in turbulence has a favorite problem, the drag law, anomalous exponents, smoothness of NS solutions. The consequence is ironically, when you make an advance in one field or one part of it, Others will not take notice and say, yeah, yeah, it's the same. Um, 
and the expectation that you have one ultimate solution i is just a totally uh, improper and uh, as i tried to sort of tried to condense them but nevertheless did not put faith on one or the other and another problem is uh, in particle physics for instance if you want to do an experiment you absolutely have to have LHC at CERN. It might cost several billion dollars, but you have to do it. There's no other way. The turbulence, I can create an experiment here and dabble a little bit. I'll create turbulence in a small box and dabble and say, I know turbulence, but that's not true. I mean, that's really not the case. So what you have is the ease with which you can actually produce something. The familiarity of the field somehow lets you into false security that you know what's happening. I think that's part of the uh, problem, in my opinion. And uh, then, uh, okay, I already said that. Um, then this makes facts easy to acquire, but solid facts are quite hard to come by. I mean, you have to work for solid facts the same hard way that you have to work in any other field. Uh, but facts, yeah, you can get them. Uh, so too much emphasis on task oriented research, uh, which is uh, partly because of the engineering focus. I have nothing against it. I'm, I graduated with an engineering degree myself. It's probably uh, not good for the field. So these are my remarks uh, for you about turbulence and how I see the thing and maybe it gives some introduction. Uh, so thank you so much. Questions, comments? Okay, the, the, the mic to you. Oh. Hi, uh, can you say something on the dissipative anomaly about uh, recent experiments? How far have they gone in measuring diverging and large gradients? Um, which recent experiments are you talking about? Just I'm so asking where are recent experiments? Like where have they reached? Um, so there are simulations and there are experiments. And in experiments, you always have boundary, boundary effects and things like that. So there are some experiments in flows like one common flows with a rotating thing, etc. And then there are simulations with which um, Karthik and I have been involved in. Now, it's possible that, as I said earlier, there is a slow decay with respect to a Reynolds number. Instead of it being a absolute constant, it may decay. Will it continue to decay forever? Or will it decay and then saturate to some value or not? This is something we do not know at the moment. I also don't think we have very good flows uh, from which to make a very, um, very definitive um, statement. Um, I, I had thought that in my second talk, I would uh, talk about it uh, in more detail, which I may still do. Thanks, Vini. So, uh, area law, what is the y-axis? And is area law related to Kolmogorov 5 uh, 4 fifth law or something? Which uh, one? Uh, the area law. You had yes. area two-third yes. going up. This has to do with the fact whether the areas of this loop have to be added or um, algebraically or whether you should just add them um, without any signs and it gives you one third for one and two thirds for the other and what i showed you was two, two thirds which simply tells you it is the scalar that you should worry, worry about yeah I, I think kardik might say a little bit more about this i think there is a very important uh, uh, that's what um, Sasha called the area rule or area law, he called it, but I called it area rule uh, just, just to uh, get the perspective right. Um, so he, he may talk more about this. I have a comment, question, and plea. So first, the comment. The comment is for me as a, uh, spend a lot of time with quantum field theory and statistical. statistical theory. I spent uh, a lot of time with uh, statistical mechanics and uh, 
quantum field theory and uh, important part of this theory is, is decreasing correlations. Correlations decrease with distance. Mm -hmm. And that is the basis for existence of the thermodynamical limit because if the velocity here, for example, is influenced by the velocity at that end of the room, that means the boundary conditions are important. And that brings the issue of universality. Yes. Um, uh, you already raised that, yes. but I, I would want to bring it to the higher extent. If you are stirring the fluid uh, with these random forces, uh, universality of solution with different random forces is not proven. And I yes. frankly doubt that maybe non-Gaussian forces would lead to different yeah. results. Uh, different profile of force would lead yeah. to different results. Yeah. And that uh, is the plea. Well, first yeah. of all, the reason why I was studying uh, circulation is because circulation doesn't have that problem. Yeah. The, uh, when, uh, the potential part of velocity drops in the circulation. It's only determined by the local vorticity, which uh, indeed could be universal. Statistics of vorticities is a universal, looks like universal yeah. picture. And velocity mostly is a Gaussian velocity, which comes from all over the place yes. uh, by central limit theory. And then there are small deviations from this Gaussian, which you measure in those moments. But I doubt that even those moments are universal. I would like to hear the proof, either experimental or uh, numerically experimental. Yes. What is the influence of a boundary? So yes. I would like to hear your opinion. So um, experimentally, it's somewhat difficult to do very controlled experiments with varying uh, uh, boundary conditions, but keeping the same flow, et cetera. But numerically, it has been tried for the problem on which you've been working now, which is the decaying turbulence. And uh, this John uh, Pernicarel, and he's there. Uh, we made a study of uh, the decaying turbulence for a number of um, uh, forcing conditions, Gaussian, non-Gaussian, um, correlated velocity field, and random velocity field, etc. And we found that within the limitations of the parameters, that many of them matter uh, for detailed uh, things. I mean, you may find everything decays according to some power law. This is uh, maybe maybe true. But if you look at the exponent very carefully or look at how the correlations themselves behave, et cetera, they have a dependence on how you force the flow. Now, is this um, uh, a particular example true of all other things, all other flows, I do not know. Uh, in fact, my problem with some of what you have been doing recently is that I don't see uh, how they are all coming through from your calculations, all these dependencies and so on. And uh, I also don't know how to relate what you calculate to what we can measure. We have to discuss that a little bit. So the short answer is, it appears that how you force a flow does have an influence and the influence may be stronger as you go deeper and deeper into details. In other words, the big picture may look the same, but you go deeper, it will start to unravel a little bit. And so I have uh, the worry that in fact, nothing may be universal in some sense in turbulence, um, but I, I'm not saying that is true, but I wonder then it's a question of then you study turbulent boundary layer for the rest of your life or grid turbulence for the rest of your life, not think about turbulence as a problem in physics, which sort of underlines, underlies many of these flows. So that question remains to be unsettled. However, if you look at um, big picture quantities like energy spectrum and how uh, turbulence impacts mixing and things like that, they seem not to care about how you, how you uh, force the flow. I believe that the distribution of circulation which you measure in your beautiful experiment is universal. Because circulation is a local quantity, and you've got something totally non Gaussian, uh, you've got a yes, yes, exponential. Yes. So I believe that is universal. But I want to distinguish between moments of vorticity, I mean, moments of circulation and moments of 
uh, velocity velocity they're different. Yeah. different. Yes, yes, they are different. They are very different. Yeah. And not only I think they are different, I think that uh, circulation moment may be universal and those may be influenced by the boundary. Yeah, it, it may be. I mean, I wouldn't know how to answer that with any um, categorical certainty because even though the measurements and uh, all that have been very detailed, it still is limited in the space of uh, initial conditions uh, that you can provide for the flow. So while I think you may be right, I have no, uh, no confidence with which I would say yes or no. The gain turbulence is also universal. You turn off any forces and let turbulence decay by its load. So uh, if you don't really shake it, at the, even at the boundary, just see how it decays, it apparently would obey its own load, no? No. Here I can categorically say that suppose I take a, a wind tunnel, put grids, one grid, change that to another type of grid, another type of grid, the exponents I get are very different, measurably different. Let's put it that way. I have a, I have a graph of that in 1984. Yeah. So in fact, somehow it is not true that it is um, even grid, uh, decaying turbulence is universal. I should probably quit, but uh, of course you have the privilege to ask any number of questions. No, no, no just a quick uh, sh uh, short question and maybe you might have even addressed it. Uh, if indeed this energy, this dissipative anomaly, it is doesn't go to a constant, but maybe decays uh, with uh, some inverse power of the Reynolds number. Is there a signature in the solutions, you mentioned that uh, the these this mathematical works, which are looking at uh, weak solutions yeah. of, uh, yeah. is there a signature which would a sharp mathematical signature which would uh, indicate this decay? Um, yes, uh, I would say, um, but like everything else, you only measure up to a certain Reynolds number you don't know how to extrapolate those behaviors. For example, uh, if you take, uh, I have this on my slide. If you take the velocity difference um, like that and uh, take the third moment of this, this is the um, um, four fifths law, the, this behavior. And instead you take, you take this, So uh, what is that? You want it larger? Yeah. Yeah. It is larger for sure, but how does it scale with the R? If you scale at the higher power R, then it will be smaller. So, this, this goes like R, right? And uh, this, let's say, r to the power one plus some epsilon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so this this is the proof. Uh, the proof that uh, I think and uh, Rivas gave is that if this is true with epsilon greater than zero, then. Uh, it is related to how epsilon varies with respect to Reynolds number. Um, so it does that and it does uh, maybe very slowly, I mean, whatever, I just exaggerated it here. But of course, I know that this is true experimentally. In fact, we had been saying that for many years. Um, it's true for a finite Reynolds number range within which you can measure. But afterwards, what happens? is not known, and in fact, this also is not known. Well, will it, uh, will it be like that, uh, you know, flatten out? In other words, there is a region where it decays very rapidly, and one where it decays very slowly, but it uh, becomes flat again. So and you, the, if you, you divide one, one by another, it's a dimensionless number. Yes. It's r in the power epsilon divided by what scale in the power epsilon? Outer scale L or Kolmogorov viscous scale uh, related to viscosity. It, if you divide uh, one by, by another, it's a dimensionless you, number. You always do this, right? 
Okay. Oh, then it could not be because then the second quantity is much smaller than the first one and it's uh, bounded by the first one. So if I think of it like this, if I have a distribution which uh, is slightly skewed, um, if it is not skewed at all, this will just go to zero and this will maybe has to do with time reversal symmetry, all that. It's not, but this one simply uh, adds up the contributions from both sides instead of subtracting one from the other. And this, these two have slightly different um, scaling properties, at least over a certain range of scales. And uh, the theorem is that if this is true for epsilon greater than zero, then this will slowly uh, decay. This does not preclude that this property is true only for a finite range of Reynolds numbers and beyond that, everything else is the same. In fact, my own belief is that that's what happens. And uh, if you fit the experimental data in this range, whether you can fit them by a power law or by another uh, function that um, returns to a flat value, it's the same. I mean, they look uh, equally good. So I couldn't tell from- okay. Let's one have just uh, one further question and then I will invite everybody to the tea break. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, that ultimately the fluid model fails and you're dumping energy to the kinetic particle systems, which are thermalizing. So whatever is the initial state, is there, are there attempts of looking at some path of uh, least, um, least uh, something which leads to the dumping of energy to the kinetic particles? Yeah. That is my first question. And second question is that uh, if by some way we are able to, uh, to um, model the enhanced turbulent transport coefficient, Will it be considered as solving the turbulence problem? Yeah, um, this, taking the second question first, uh, many people would say that is the important question in turbulence. And that is, uh, this is what I showed uh, by the, by the uh, curve of transport in uh, convection as a function of Rayleigh number. If you can somehow say that, uh, maybe I shouldn't worry and I don't have to worry about uh, uh, exponents and all of this kind of stuff, however interesting it might be to some people here. Um, so there is a part of the turbulence community which will say, yeah, you have really done something very important. And I would agree and everybody else probably would agree. Although many other problems would remain. Uh, with respect to the first question, um, you can uh, talk about particles and uh, molecules and things like that. But the nice thing about having Navier-Stokes is that uh, you have um, a continuum motion of the dynamics that will capture most of the uh, relevant dynamics. And uh, if you want to simulate, it's much easier, much more reasonable to work with Navier-Stokes than with billions of molecules. Let's thank the speaker again, maybe. And then we can look at it. Thank you. Okay.